Hey everybody, this week we are doing a special episode where we're letting you listen to our Patreon podcast, MPU the Sequel. Now that is the spin-off podcast, if you will, where we uh, explore movies with only one sequel to them. So this week we're letting you hear the Monsters University episode. It's super cool. Um, and then I, we would both encourage you to just head over to patreon.com slash Micah McCaw, M-I-C-A-H-M-C-C-A-W. There's a link in the description. And sign up and get all of our awesome episodes, including this month's Gremlins 2, and then next month it's Zoolander. So sign up now. Welcome, patrons. It is November. Um, it's Monsters University time. We For we, MPU the sequel. MP, yes, welcome to MPU the sequel. Um, we're excited to share this movie with you. I think the general consensus for this movie is that people... It tend, slaps? Well, yes. People tend to like it, but I do remember when this came out, you know, it came out after Cars 2, and it came out after... Um, well, before Finding Dory, but, th- you know, there's an element of, like, is is Pixar, like, running out of tricks, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think we're here to provide you with the option that this movie does not fall into the category of, like, lame sequel. No. This is a great movie. There is new ground to cover. I love this movie. Me too. I, I'm, just, I'm just putting it all out there right away. Because I, I do think, I think time will look, look well on it. Mm-hmm. But the first movie is so good that it's like, what could they have possibly done to like outdo themselves? But I think this movie does the thing that we talk about a lot on this podcast, where it does not try to outdo it itself. No. It just tells you a different part. Yep. That's what's beautiful about Toy Story. And that's what's beautiful about this. Yep. And I think this is a great movie. So um, thank you so much for listening, <laughs> everybody. Um, yeah. Do you want anything to throw right at the beginning? Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Okay, so right away we have Dan Scanlon's first movie. Um, he is a director of a mockumentary called Tracy, Mater and the Ghost Light, like a short. Yeah. And then he also did um, two, 2020's Pixar, uh, Pixar movie Onward. So oh, right. This is the same right. director as okay. Onward. Um, I think this movie's a lot better than Onward. But um, not that Onward's a bad movie. This movie's just a lot better. Mm-hmm. Um, screenplay is Dan Gerson, who did the screenplay for Big Hero 6 and Monsters, Inc. Uh, Robert L. Baird, who did Big Hero 6 and the, the, the cartoon Ferdinand that came out a couple yeah. of years ago. Um, and Dan Scanlon, who's the writer and director of this. Um, story by the same guys. I don't know why they have to have both a story by and a screenplay by, but you know what? Whatever. Hey, they fought for that. <laughs> yeah. And then we have music by Randy Newman. Now, um, also, in this episode, maybe should we insert it now? We'll insert it now. We have an interview with, there is a song in this movie. that Kind of like the theme. Yeah, and it goes, and it's just unbelievable. And yeah. the second time I watched this movie, which was earlier this summer, um, I was like, man, I got to... I, like Randy Newman really outdid himself with this song. Is what <laughs> yeah, I thought. Yeah. And I was like, it's so good. And then I looked it up and I'm like, oh, it's this band called March 4th. Yeah. And I start doing some research and listening and it's the band's like, all their music is like this. Just total bangers. Slaps. And I thought, what the heck? Let's just see. They're a band from Portland. They're pretty big, but maybe, maybe we could have them on the podcast, one of the guys yeah. or gals. And interview him. And guess what? We got him. So here is the interview, and then we'll get back to the rest of the episode. Hello, patrons. Here we are. We're on the interview section of this episode, and we have a very exciting guest. It's Jason Wells, who's been involved with the band March 4th 
or depending on which album you're looking up, sometimes under March 4th, uh, marching band. Mm -hmm. And he's also a sound engineer. And uh, welcome to the show, Jason. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. We wanted to talk to you um, first and foremost. Uh, what, so what is your involvement with and past or present with the band March 4th? Well, uh, originally back in 2003, I uh, was and am a trumpet player. And I saw them perform at a vaudeville show called Ms. Kitty's Parlor, and I was completely blown away and ran out into the parking lot. It was pissing rain and <laughs> said I would love to join the group. And uh, back then it was very easy. All you had to do was show up. They had a nice. massive band, too. It was almost 40 people Whoa. Uh, with bizarre instruments and like flute. I mean, things that don't exist in the band at all now. Mm -hmm. um, and a whole bunch of dancers and... It was uh, incredibly exciting, and then over the years, I became head of the brass section and then started managing the group, and because I'd had a lot of experience professionally in terms of film scores and licensing music, I also became the licensing agent for the group and mm -hmm. handled all contracts when people were interested in using March Ports music in their projects, film projects and otherwise. Um, and I still act uh, in a business-like role uh, in that way when they have questions about licensing, although things really haven't come up most recently, so I haven't had any involvement with it. Um, so, but mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what is, I guess, how long is your history with licensing and all of that, that stuff when it comes to putting music in movies? I've been um, doing this now for almost 30 years. Wow, nice. Wow, um, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I started uh, as soon as I got out of college uh, working for a production company in Atlanta, Georgia called Bottom Line Productions, which no longer exists, and became the company's in-house composer and sound designer and learned it from the ground up, really, and, and then you know graduated from, from that place and got hired at a place called Todd A.O., Atlanta, which is an extension of Tadeo Studios from Los Angeles. And there's also a location in New York and London. <clears throat> and that was when I kind of hit the big time and started working for uh, essentially Turner Networks. They were okay. almost Got our it. only client, but um, started doing original music work for their ads, you know, typically promoting films or their series and whatnot. And just got a uh, a good feel for how the whole thing works in terms of licensing music and how much to charge for original music if somebody oh, approaches cool. you to do a composition, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wow. awesome. So then when it comes to, you know, Pixar and, you know, the movie we're covering is Monsters University, which has the mm -hmm. awesome song Rise Up as the title, right? The, the, the song the is called Gospel. Oh, Gospel. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But, I got okay. it confused because the they sing Rise Up in the recorded version and right. the album yeah. is called Rise Up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, I, yeah. yeah. There's a few so with, examples of, of songs in the band I wish we'd named differently, and that's one of them. <laughs> uh, there was one I wrote that has this big chorus with everyone going, oh, yeah, feeling alive. And I should have named the song Feeling Alive. Uh -huh. Which would have made perfect sense, and anybody who bought the album would know exactly if they went to one of our shows. <laughs> oh, there's that song. Unfortunately, the song was titled "The Finger," um, <laughs> which was an inside joke where we we, we constantly—it wasn't like the middle finger, but if we had to cue the band to go to the next big change, um, you know, if I was leading a song, I would always stick my hand in the air and hold my my first finger in the air, which meant you know, go to the chorus. Okay. Or Very whatever. cool. Um, and I, if I could go back in time, God, because once you register a song, it's over. Um, right. I, I would do anything to change my song to feeling alive. <laughs> and the same case with gospel, because everyone does what you just did. You know, right. uh, they, they, I love that song, Rise Up. But actually, right. yeah, that is, you are correct. It's the name of the album, which, of yes. course, got the name from that chorus in the gospel song. But, but the not song the itself song. is called Gospel, <laughs> yes. Well, see, and I felt very silly about that because 
I I'm an indie rock musician, and I mm. I when I title songs, I try not to do the the I guess you could say obvious uh, uh, right. thing. And so when I and realized that's, and that's what why I had you're done, suffering financially like I am, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you thought you were being so hip, and no, I thought I was being you clever. Made, you made a huge mistake. Yeah. <laughs> guess guess what? Call Paul McCartney named "Let It Be." Let it be. Right. <laughs> Pretty smart. Guess what? Get back is called. Get back. Guess what? Blackbird is called. Blackbird. <laughs> Man, you. Yeah. The next album might have some different different titles than I would have originally titled them now after this yep. conversation. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, so yeah, with that song specifically getting into um, how it got into this movie. Um, so I just to kind of like give you some background when Mike and I first saw this movie, I mean, we didn't see it together, but we, I just remember we're both like this song is just incredible. And we didn't know for a while that it wasn't Randy Newman because yeah, he, right. you know, he could, he did the score for the movie. So yes. then like, you know, after a while figuring it out, it's like, oh my gosh, what is this band? This is so cool. So, yeah. you know, a score done by Randy Newman, pretty big guy, pretty big deal. But then this like iconic theme song to me, not done by him. It's like, how does that, what happened? Like, how did they find this amazing song to put it in there? And I guess that's like my question of how all that worked. Well, they actually found it out of the cosmos in that uh, we weren't obviously uh, pitching our music to Disney mm -hmm. in any way. And, and uh, it's not like we were on some list, you know, that got us in front of them or anything of the sort. Uh, they wanted a college marching band sounding thing for the movie. Okay. Wow. And Randy Newman really didn't understand the genre. Mm-hmm. And at the time, marching band stuff was becoming hip. Like March 4th wasn't the only one yeah. doing what we were doing. Um, and I, I'll never forget, because, you know, we at the time, we thought we were going to go to the stratosphere, like we were going to be on David Letterman. And there was mm -hmm. a lot of bites, and, and we were touring the country for the first time, uh, toured uh, Germany for the first time. And we were on quite a roll. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I remember watching the Grammys and Radiohead's <clears throat> album and Rainbows had just come out and they performed the first song off the album live with a marching band at the Grammys oh, and yeah. I was a, and I was just like oh that was unbelievable look. it was unbelievable um, but I so somehow uh, looking for marching band music March fourth was discovered by the powers that be at Disney. And suddenly I was contacted out of the blue. Oh, by this wow. lady. And, and she said, we're really interested in using this track of music. Um, and apparently Randy Newman tried to imitate it and he, and he couldn't, wow. um, with all due respect to Randy Newman. I yeah. mean, he's a, you know, he's brilliant, but, but it really wasn't his, his thing. And so they wanted to license it outright from us. And it was really a, a, tricky situation because um, it was definitely the, the most big league moment of my career and that they only offered us dollars for it. I guess I don't know if we're supposed to talk money here and I'm probably just hey. I'm probably going to get sued now, but you know, the number <laughs> it's one of those things. It's like the highest number we'd ever been offered to license something. And yeah. yet there's this little greedy part of our brains that go, but this is Disney. You right, know, it's a movie you know, that made seven hundred thousand dollars, or two hundred, <laughs> yeah. or a million dollars for it. You know, <laughs> right? Um, and they're they they play hardball. You know, I I came back. You know, this kind of. I mean, I how do you how do you ask for more when they hey we're yeah. offering? You know, it's like yeah, but I was wondering. Hey, maybe we get a little more because you're Disney. And right. we're, yeah. you know, this small, you own the tiny world. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and the lady's like, no, this is all we have in the budget, you know, hitting me with, but, you know, I guess, you know, that was the last they had to spend on Monsters University, which I doubt. Right. Um, <laughs> highly. Um, so, you know, and, and even my uh, fellow uh, members of management in March 4th, and that would be Faith, John, and Nayana. I mean, they all kind of knew I was a little out of my league as well in the moment, but I don't know what else we could have done better other than, you know, hired a, a lawyer or some, right. somebody to, yeah, you know, manhandle Disney a little bit harder than, than, than I did. 
Um, but ultimately, they did offer us a little bit more. Oh, very um, cool. But then they, but then they said, but that's it. You mm-hmm. know, and, and it's pretty much take it or we're going to go find something else to be in the movie. Um, so we... So we we went with it. And I tell you, there was a little bit of a, a weird tragedy that occurred in that, in all of that, um, the, the songs in the film and, uh, and like so many people, like the way you responded to it, you know, you were like, oh, wow, what is this? I love this. Well, they didn't give us a credit in the closing credits for the DVD release. It was in the theatrical oh. release, but, but they, it was some oh, oversight. What? That, that, that our, is weird. That our credit wasn't there. And I, I almost like wonder, was that some kind of weird, like, you know, uh, revenge move because I asked for, for, for more money or something? I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Huh. And I called them up and I was so just heartbroken. I said, I could believe it. She, oh, yeah, it happens all the time, she says. Okay. You know, that credits get left off. It's like, yeah, but how many people are going to see this and go, oh, I want to know what that song was and they can't find it? Um, yeah. I remember another... it took me a while to figure it out. Yeah, how did you find it, Micah? I think I just, I think I was like, I, I was clicking through the Randy Newman score and I couldn't find the song. Mm-hmm. And then I just started doing some Googling and I think there was like a, a Quora or like a Reddit where someone yeah. was like, what is this song? I can't find it. And then someone was like, oh, it's right. March 4th. You can always Shazam it, you know, right off your television. Thankfully yes. the oh. song is in the, <laughs> Didn't even is think in the of clear. That. A lot of people have found it that way. Um, and yes, there's enough. I mean, I have it front and center on my website, mm-hmm. uh, March 4th. You know, and th- that's the thing. If you just, if you look a little bit, you'll hit it. Right. Um, yeah. but, but yeah, they left us off the, the damn credit roll. I, huh. I, I, and, and there was nothing we could do about it. They already printed it. It was done. You know, right. and I was like, I was like, well, what the, hell? you know, and there was, and unfortunately, you know, there was nothing in the contract that guaranteed we would have the credit. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's one of those things that maybe if we had a, a lawyer, yeah. you know, who, who and I should have, I guess, thought of that when we did the contract that I want to make sure that we're in the credits or or else, you know, but I just assumed because that's how it's done. Everybody lists everything in the credits, no matter yeah. what, all the way down to the you know craft service and the, you know, the <laughs> the son of the producer who went and got I, someone a cup of coffee. They'll put that in there, but yeah. they, yeah. you know, but especially they won't play... a song that's like the theme T- to me. That's like yeah. the theme of the movie. It's yeah. played like at least twice, but maybe three times. Well, yeah. And, and it's, it's the climax of the movie going right. into, well, not the climax, the ending going right. into the closing credits. My other yeah. criticism of it is their music editor did a terrible job. Um, because I edit music all the time. The cuts are terrible. Oh, okay. I did notice uh, that on this the, viewing. Yeah, the way he looped it at the end, it was like, he, he, you know, it's like, and the edits are bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, so I feel like I'm dissing on it a little bit. But yeah, there was a little bit of pain in my heart about aspects of, of it. And, and uh, but, you know, there it was. And we, we went and saw it in the theater and it was on the on the big screen and at least the theatrical version had our credit in it. So everything felt yeah. right with the world at that time. And um, I mean, the song is amazing enough that it, that, I mean, I'll speak for ourselves looking yeah. it up and I know, you know, cause you probably found it on a Reddit thread that other people have been looking it up too. So right. like, yeah, right. As simple so as that's amazing. I'm sitting here right now. I'm just curious. I haven't done this in a while. I'm going on to <laughs> Google. Let's just, uh, just punch <laughs> up a uh, song in, Monsters University song. Oh, right up. Gospel oh, good. closing theme in my, by March 4th. Bam. That's there good. It comes up. That's awesome. Yeah. You love to see it. I'm happy. I'm happy for you that that, <laughs> that is coming no, through. It was the top thing. Gospel by March 4th marching band featured in, I mean, with a big window the Good. first thing you see. Yes. So That's take awesome. that Disney, you know, <laughs> can't keep you down. <laughs> you, you bastards. Right. And they left <laughs> us off the soundtrack too. And that was because Randy Newman, uh, didn't want someone else's music on the soundtrack. He was possessive of it. So they didn't oh. even offer us uh, a deal for that. That's really disappointing. Wow. I know. I know. Wow, that is wow! You're really letting us behind the curtain there. That's very yeah. interesting. Because of course we were interested. And what about a you know what about the soundtrack? You know, because that's a whole separate deal, by the way. You don't 
right, one that was makes the, sense. The, the license for the music and the other is the license for you know releasing a record um i love saying records still because i'm 50 but <laughs> oh um, yeah but anyway um they they said yeah they they don't want to have it on there and you know um and there's a lot of examples of that throughout history uh you know like the full metal jacket soundtrack doesn't have the rolling stones paint it black on it which is what closes oh, the film yeah and that's like the thing you remember the most is the fade out and hearing you know and it's not on the soundtrack because the stones didn't want it on there or vice versa you know right. whatever it is Man. so they left us out off the cd as well so we've had to fight for ourselves and apparently that worked because yeah there it is yeah. The internet's helped. Or I guess probably, you know, people looking it up and people sharing it around and all that. Well, I guess yeah. that that kind of like answers a little bit of the next question, but also goes into it of um, was this song like, you know, one of the fan favorites before this movie? Or like, did you notice any differences after this movie came out with the song being featured in it? question again i uh i got a little yeah sorry uh, it was just kind of like two questions one so i guess like be yeah. I'll, I'll start with the first one so like sure. was this before the movie before the song mm -hmm. was in it was this mm -hmm. like any kind of fan favorite song oh okay yes um it it uh well i mean at the time we were playing all kinds of great music and right and that was definitely uh, one of the, the great moments in our shows. I can't, I don't know if it was a fan favorite per se. Uh, March 4th was just at the time on such a, a roller coaster. And, uh, you know, I, I just kind of lump it all together as everyone loved March 4th at that time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's, that's cool. awesome. You know, so then I, yeah. Um, but yeah. when that song was played during our shows, the, the, that rise up section, that was one of the first times we had a, in, in any of our songs, a big sing along chorus. Cool. And so we got the whole audience singing with us. Um, and so that was a really special moment for sure. Of and, course, yeah. you know, and, and, that, and then, and that section, the, the band, we all set our instruments down and, you know, we're all singing as well. Um, and if you pay attention to that session, the section, the only thing you hear is the bass. I think there yeah. might be a, a drum still just holding the, the rhythm, but maybe not. Maybe it's just the bass. So that was a, a such a unique moment, and then after that, I uh, we had a lot of songs that started emerging, like the one I was telling you about that I wrote, for instance, that had mm -hmm. just these sing along moments that yeah. were really catchy, but nothing else, like no verses or you know choruses, just just like two words, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, like rise up or feeling alive or whatever that were more like chants, yeah. Um, and that we could get the whole audience going on. Um, that kind of became a, like I said, yeah, a pattern for a while. I don't know. Very now. cool. Yeah. yeah. So I guess like the second question is, and I know you've, you've kind of answered it. Um, but I'm also curious, like since the movie has then come out with the song being featured in it, um, yeah. have, have you noticed like, or, or when it happened, like, did you notice like a change in the band or a change in like, there are more people listening to us now than before? Um, not dramatically, yeah. You know? well. It was we we definitely it it definitely picked up people's ears and and I, I uh, I'd have to go back and <laughs> honestly look at all the statistics to see. I know like, it's been a did, while did, now. Did did we have a jump in sales? I mean, this yeah. is uh, what is this twenty twelve when this happened? I think it's like twenty thirteen. Yeah, twenty twenty thirteen. Um, you know maybe, um, yeah. you know and maybe gospel got a whole bunch of additional downloads around that time right. or, you know, or after the DVD was released and, uh, you know, again, like so many things in every band's career, um, it was yet another knocking on the door. Like, Oh my God, we're in this Disney movie. What's next. And then the answer was nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, you think, Oh my God, this is the next step. This is the big one. And, you know, actually that was it, you know, Wow. Um, but we do still get royalties from it. Um, and that's good. And yeah. Eric Miller actually is the writer of the song. He was one of our trumpet players at the time. And uh, he did very well for himself um, with with his ASCAP royalties. OK, so, I was wondering about if if 
you were you still get royalties like when it's played on TV and and stuff yeah. like that. Okay, yeah, all, cool. All that was set in motion, so I, there's still checks coming in. But again, I haven't been a part of that mm-hmm. for a while now. I haven't, um, you know, my relationship with March Fourth is purely spiritual at this point. Yeah. Um, okay. Although it was uh, it was great. We we did a New Year's Eve show together. I also have a group called the Saloon Ensemble. And um, and we joined together to do this big New Year's Eve event, also along with my uh, fiance's project, The Cat's Meow, which is a big burlesque jazz show. So the, the nice. three groups, oh, wow. the three groups got together and um, and that was, I think, the second to last March 4th performance. They did um, their anniversary show on March the 4th. I forget what year, maybe the 15th anniversary, 14th anniversary of the band. Oh. Um, and then a week later, um, the quarantine hit. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, March 4th hasn't played a note since. Oh, man. Bummer. Nor have any of us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, my question is, you, you do, you know, film scoring as well, um, but... I saw that you had done the um, Stain Boy with Tim Burton. Is that was that you, or was that before you were working with your company? Uh, that was me, and it was um, my my company, meaning Audio Wells. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was me, independent. I hadn't um, formed Audio Wells yet, but I uh, had a friend in Los Angeles who was an animator and was running in animation studio called flinch studios and they were the ones doing tim burton stain boy series and that was at a time you know the web was still crude and web animation was still crude Mm -hmm. and this was kind of a new thing like tim burton's directing tiny cartoons going straight to web and uh danny elfman scored the first two episodes but uh was too busy for it and oh yeah they had me audition basically and i i scored episode three and was given a number and there were other composers who threw their names in the hat as well and sure enough tim burton picked mine wow that is so, so cool. I, that's so cool so i went on to score episodes three through six which was all there was um uh-huh. and uh so it was and danny elfman is one of my idols and I, I produce a live version of the nightmare before christmas right here in portland which would be happening tonight um, oh which, yeah dang. there's a dagger in my heart that's a show i've been uh producing and i sing all the danny elfman songs i actually have danny elfman's exact voice it's funny i i um oh wow i i i, I nail him yeah um and well, so uh so it was just kind of like a quasi dream come true and to to, to to actually say to people yeah i replaced danny elfman <laughs> yeah. uh, as as a composer Talk about another thing that led nowhere, um, but it was a definitely a, a, a moment in time. And yeah, there I am collaborating cool. with, with Tim directly and, and uh, you know, and, you know, some, I think at the end there was some kind of, well, hopefully we can work together in the future. I'm like, great. Wouldn't that be something? And we never did. And yeah. Danny Elfman to this day still scores everything Tim Burton produces. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe if he does another cheap web commercial, I'll get a phone call or something. <laughs> well, see, we're in Medford, Oregon. So uh, if, uh, if, if, goodness, if next year everything's back open, we will have to come to the Nightmare Before Christmas show. Yes. I've that sounds never so heard cool. of this. This is so amazing. I am yeah. so excited about it. <laughs> oh, good. One of my favorite movies. And I didn't know that something so close to me did a live version of it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, we've, wow. we've been doing it forever. Um, I forget how many years now. You lose track. Yeah. I'm actually looking at the... I have a poster hanging here in my recording studio from our 2018 show. I guess I never put the blank annual. I think every time we get up there every year, I, I always have to like do math. Wait, which one is this? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Is this the, the ninth annual? I, I forget, but it's been something like that. Yeah. Awesome. And that's, yeah, so that's cool. really cool. Well... You know, um, do you have any more questions, Jordan? Nope. I don't have any other, more. Other than anything you want to promote, yeah. any upcoming things that, you, that you're that you working on? 
If only. Uh, yeah. I'd like to promote the ending of the coronavirus so that yes. we can all return to playing music again, because uh, uh, everything in my life has been erased. And uh, I'm des- yeah. desperate for work. Um, I, you know, production has dropped off in general. I've hardly had any post-production work since June. And all uh, events have been canceled. We have a, the White Album Christmas usually happening a month from now, I'm also in a Beatles cover band, and that's been like a sold-out show. Uh, we, we usually run it for uh, eight to ten shows every December, um, and also a big paycheck, too. Yeah. You know, it's like there's the financial into, too, but uh, none of these things exist, and there will be yeah. no New Year's Eve, and, you know, everything is yeah. just, uh, we can't, you know, bet on anything anymore. We just have to wait until, right. you know, like March 4th. You know, they tour on a big bus together and, you know, yeah. when, when when can that happen again? Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, so I just promote uh, voting for Joe Biden on. <laughs> yeah. On this Tuesday will actually come out. This will come out uh, Wednesday. <laughs> OK, good. I hope we're all smiling on Wednesday morning to at least yes. <laughs> solve half of the problem. Um, we'll we'll of, all be like country. Great. He told us to vote and we already did and we're good and everything's Excellent. fine. <laughs> um, you know, and I just I, I look forward to a, a brighter future because this has definitely been a, a dark chapter uh, in music, to be sure. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, well we appreciate having you. Thank you, or so you much. coming on. <laughs> oh, my uh, pleasure. And uh, uh, thanks for shedding some light on on a part of the industry that is rarely talked about unless you're with other musicians that want to get their music licensed. Yes. (laughs) So I hope that our audience enjoyed this. And now back to the episode. Now it's just us again, right? Yes. Jordan? Hope you learned something. Yes. I. uh, We did. Now, frankly, because you're patrons, we can tell you this kind of stuff. We haven't recorded the interview yet. Why would you say that? Well, because I want to say that I'm lo- I'm still looking forward to it. I can't oh, wait. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's time travel. It's fun. Okay. okay. It's fun. Uh, and so now we have the cinematography. Now this is one of those um, Pixar movies that has two cinematographers. So it has Matt Asprey who did the camera. Yeah. So he did he did um, Soul and Coco. But what's oh, whoa? Yeah, what's weird is on IMDb he's not listed as a cinematographer, but he is on the movie. What is he listed as on IMDb? He's not on IMDb for this movie. Oh, which I thought was kind of odd. Did and he slip through the cracks? Quite the oversight. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Um, and then we also have John Claude Kalache, who did the lighting, and we've talked about him before because he did the lighting in Toy Story Four. Okay, so. And we noticed. <laughs> yeah. And the lighting in this, come on. Come the on. lighting and the camera. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of, did you notice in this, there were like steady cam shots. Mm-hmm. Just a couple. Yeah. And it was like, I don't, I really don't understand how it you can do that. It is insane when they do that. And, you know, there's like crane shots yep. and stuff. And I know. It's really it's like you're already doing so much. You really didn't have to do this, but okay, we'll take it. Well, and what's also weird that we were talking, we, we just mentioned it last night, is it was like, this one does not feel like it's aged a single day. Like, it feels mm-hmm. like it could have come out this year, and I'd still be like, what? I know. What? And it, but it came out June 21st, 2013. That's so crazy to me that this movie is um, seven years old. Yeah. Um, it does not look seven years old. I was in college old. when this movie came out. Yeah. Do, do you big let, resonation tell me about word? your experience with the movie the first time i was so excited to see it because monsters monsters inc uh is is slash was i don't know like my no, favorite you said it's your favorite okay okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite so when when they were making a sequel and finding out where it was set all that stuff it was like cool i'm in i don't even care <laughs> it could have been said anywhere but now it's set in something that i'm going to relate to Bring it on. Right, right. Um, First and, you, were the, you were the age of boo. Mm-hmm. Now you're the age of the college. And seeing it, I like we've said before, it is so fun to see a Pixar movie in theaters because of all the children. It's so fun. Giggling. So that, it was just a wonderful theater experience. But even watching it too, it was, I just loved every second of it. And yeah. it's not like, yeah, I don't know. It's just like, this is so, even though I didn't like quite relate to any, like everything that they went through, 
Mm-hmm. When they for the college trope stuff, because my college was not like a normal college, I would say. Um, it was still like this is really cool. Like I because of pure it is college, it's like, oh man, I I get it. Yeah. I get yeah. like you're trying to prove yourself to other people who don't know who you are and you're trying to find who you are and you have all these pre- preconceived notions of who you want to be and going to a place where it's kind of like a clean slate yeah. and you can be whoever you want to be. And sometimes you're a big jerk and yeah. you have to get knocked down a couple pegs to just to realize that you're not all that in a bag of chips. And then sometimes you have these big goals and you have to learn that you can still achieve those, but maybe in a different way than you thought you could do it. Yep. Um, this movie, oddly enough, makes me nostalgic for a college career that I never had. Yeah. Because <laughs> I watch this movie and I'm like, man, yeah, college was fun. And I never went to college. I took a couple of classes. That was it. Um, and I was never attracted to this scene at all. Yeah. Um, well, what's, it, was, what's, it wouldn't have been as fun right and this is like this is like fun because it doesn't have like i mean it has a light amount of hazing but you know it's like like i watch this movie and i'm like oh fraternities seem really fun and cool <laughs> but if you know and then you me, just you know endless articles about abuse <laughs> well and if you know me you know that i would not do well in yeah. a fraternity i wouldn't yeah. enjoy it i would probably be very upset <laughs> yeah um the first time i saw this movie i saw it with grayson phelps and I believe his mother, Renee Phelps. Nice. And my mother. Nice. <laughs> I think it was. It was a play date. I think it was, yeah, just the three of us. And I was just like, this is, uh, it was just slam dunk. Like the all six of us just laughing the whole mm-hmm. movie. We were just loving it. And I do think I was kind of jamming out to the March 4th song. Yeah. Um, And then this was a, ye- this was the year where, um, I, I a lot of times I'll do songwriting goals. So this year I was like, okay, every movie I see in theaters, I'm going to write a song about it. So I saw like Django Unchained. I saw Argo, which turned into History Repeats Itself, which actually made an album, which is kind of nuts. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this year I did, uh, or I, I made this song that was called We Scare Because We Care. And it had this great melody and I never did anything with it, but um, the melody is still in my head, and yeah. I think the melody kind of rules. Yeah. Um, maybe you should do something with it. Maybe it probably wouldn't be this, but yeah. Um, I, I would probably change the lyrics, but it was a fun experiment to try. Mm-hmm. And I know Grayson knows the melody pretty well. Like if I called him right now and mm-hmm. said, "What was that monsters song I wrote?" He'd be like, "We scare because we care." <laughs> he would just jump <laughs> right into it. Yeah. Um. So that was my experience with the movie. And then I hadn't watched it a second time until like June this year or whatever. Like we were a couple months. Yeah, into I think the that pandemic, was my second time too. And I was like, oh, I just want to watch this movie. Yeah. And I was kind of like, is it going to hold up? Uh, just like when we were watching Finding Dory and I'm like, I hope this holds up. And then it did not at all. And this time it was like, OK. And then it, I was like, oh, yeah, this to- this movie rules so hard. OK. Now let's talk about the budget of this movie. It's a $200 million budget. The movie domestically makes $268.4 million, and then worldwide it makes $743.5 million. Now, do you remember when we talked about Toy Story 2 and we talked about Circle 7 animation? No. Okay, so um, there, was, there was a sequel that they were going to make for Monsters, Inc. back like around the Toy Story 2 time. Okay. Well, I guess Monsters, Inc. wouldn't have been out yet, but around that same time, because there was this company... Um, Circle K. So Michael Eisner, owner of Disney, and Didn't Jobs, <laughs> and Steve Jobs had a disagreement, so Pixar was not in charge of the sequels to their movies, or at least this movie. Um, and then Iger, Bob Iger, took over and became the head of Disney, and he got the rights back, and he gave Pixar the sequel. So it was going to be made with Circle 7 Animation, which was also what Toy Story 2 was going to be made. And that was the company that um, w- would have done like direct to DVD. Oh, okay. It, it was like Walt, Walt Disney Company was trying to have like a company that would just like put out like sequels. Yeah. Like, like quickly. Yeah. So of course. It, Before streaming. Yes. <laughs> um, so that was almost what we got. And it would have been Monsters, Inc. 2 Lost in Scaradice. Um, with Mike and Sully visiting the human world to give Boo a birthday present. 
So it would have been like a sequel sequel, not a prequel. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm glad we didn't get that. I think that's the wrong move. Yeah. And I think she was supposed to be like, you know, like 18 or something like that. Like oh, older. okay. Um, which could have been a real disaster. Yes. Yeah, I that's see just, you're just thinking. I just don't even want to think about I don't know that it would be bad, but if Pixar didn't do it, would they know what to do? Yeah. Well, this is the funny thing. So by this point in the podcast, we've talked all four Monsters, Inks. I mean, Toy Stories. Yeah. We've talked Incredibles, Finding Nemo, and Monsters now. And it is really interesting, and it's a testament to, as an artist, sometimes you really have to keep digging away at something that maybe you think is good, but it's not quite perfect. Because almost all the movies that we talked about, I would say save for Finding Dory, they were like, oh, here's the idea for the sequel, or here's the idea for the movie, and the first draft of that movie is nothing like what the ending of the movie was. Yeah. So it's like Monsters 2, Lost in Scaradice. There's a there's a there's probably a whole script somewhere in the Disney vault for that that doesn't look a single thing like this movie. So they kept working on it. They kept doing it until they had something that they felt worth presenting to the world. Yeah. Toy Story movies are like the perfect example. Like every time we got into one of those, it was like, this is what the fir- the movie was going to be. And you're reading it and you're like, did any of that make that into the movie? <laughs> right. So. It's interesting. It's encouragement to artists. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, so I just have two more notes. Um, there was a line in the first movie where Mike says to Sully, you've been jealous of my good looks since the fourth grade. And the director of the movie was like racking his brain because he's like, I, they got to meet in college, but he was like, maybe I'll do a flashback scene where they meet in fourth grade and stuff like that. And then Pete Doctor and John Lasseter said, it's great that you want to honor that, but you have to do what's right for the story. So now, jokingly, Scanlan, uh, the director, says that the line is a monster expression that many monsters I say. I kind of take, I mean, if, you, if you're really trying to make it work, that's what it'd be like, oh, it's just a thing that people say. Yeah, so you might be like, you're jealous of me since the fourth grade. Uh-huh. That's, what, that's something monsters say. Uh-huh. I like, I'm for it. I Whatever. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was a good workaround. Um, so then, um, for you animation nerds, I'm going to read this from um, Wikipedia because it's hard to figure out. But this is... Uh, they developed this technology called global illumination for the movie. So global illumination or indirect illumination is a group of algorithms used in 3D computer graphics that are meant to add more realistic lighting to 3D scenes. Such algorithms take into account not only the light that comes directly from a light source, but also subsequent causes in which light rays from the same source are reflected by other surfaces in the scene whether reflective or not. Theoretically, reflections, refractions, and shadows are all examples of global illumination because when simulating them, one object affects the rendering of another as opposed to an object being affected only by a direct source of light. So they created an algorithm to do that? Yeah. That so makes this a lot is... of sense to me, and it answers a lot of questions for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think... Because if there was no algorithm, I don't know if this movie would ever get made. Yeah. Like, they would still be working on it right now. It's if to, to make it at the level that they made it. Well, and, and I think a, a good example of what it is in this movie, when they're at the um, fraternity party, there's like lights going off mm-hmm. and you can see the lights changing um, mm-hmm. to the beat of the music on Sully's face. And it's completely changing the lighting with each time the lights move. But it's taking into account like shadows and how it's not just, again, one source of light. Yep. It's reflecting off of things. So whether you like the movie or not, the like all modern animation like uses this. Well, it makes sense too why the texture looks so much better. I'm sure that's why part of the reason why the hair looks so so real. Yeah. Yeah, cuz they can get all those shadows and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Crazy. Yeah. So, um that's what I got for the movie. Okay, let's dig through this quick. We have Helen Mirren who plays Dean Hardscrabble. She is in Red, The Queen, Hitchcock, The Duke, The Good Liar, and a crap ton of other stuff because it's Helen Mirren. 
She, oh, wait. And then Squishy is played by Peter Sohn, who is in The Good Dinosaur, um, Ratatouille, The Incredibles, voice actor. Which one is Squishy? Squishy, I believe, is the like his mom. Like they live at his mom's house. Oh, right? yeah. Yes, that's Squishy. Yeah. Okay. Dawn is played by Joel Murray, who is in Mad Men, God Bless America, The Artist, and a lot of TV. Don oh. was the guy with the mustache. Yeah. And then Sean Hayes plays Terry with an I, um, who is the Will and Grace guy. Also in Cat in the Hat, the Three Stooges, Cats and Dogs. And who plays the other Terry is Dave Foley, who was a, it was a surprise to be reminded that he plays Flick in A Bug's Life. Crazy to me. Yes, that kind of blew my mind. He also bit. was just in a crap ton of TV. Like a crap ton of TV. <laughs> And then we have Charlie Day, who plays Art. Uh, it's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Yes. Among other things. Well, but <laughs> You're really cruising here. Yeah, well, there's a lot of people. It's a Pixar movie. Alfred Molina plays Professor Knight. Uh, Dr. Octavius, hello. Um, Tyler Labine plays Greek Council VP. Oh, I'm not going to get this deep into it, but I clicked on his name. <laughs> He's in Tucker and Dale versus Evil. He's... Tucker or he's Dale. He's Dale. He's not Alan Tudyk is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, I can look right now and see which character he is. <laughs> um, Nathan Fillion's in this movie, best known as Castle. Who is he? Johnny. Johnny. Oh, I bet he's the oh, frat he's, guy. Yeah, he's the, he, he, yeah. Cool. Um, Aubrey Plaza's in this movie, Greek Council President. Uh, she's in Parks and Rec. Hello. <laughs> um, Bobby Moynihan plays Chet. He is in SNL. And a ton of comedy bang bang. One of the best comedy bang bang guests, Bobby yes. Moynihan. And then we're there's also just a ton of guest voice acting from people like John Krasinski, uh, who's in the beginning of the movie. Bill Hader plays a couple characters. Um, John Ratzenberger, of course, is in this movie. Um, and then just a ton of voice actors as well. Do you see? I don't want to forget about this, and this will be fun for the audience. Do you see that the computer has made marks on this? We should probably put like a placemat there. down right here. Yeah, there there's like four four marks. So oh, that's just a I'm little not that worried about it. Behind the scenes for our audience. So we are very DIY. This is our Jordan's work desk. <laughs> and yeah, that's about eat. it. Very cool. Oh, this was fun to find out. Jason Marsden does additional voices. He plays Haku in Spirit Who's of the Jason Way. Jason Marsden. He plays Haku. Oh. He's also Max in the Goofy movie. He's in Hocus He's Pocus. Ma- wow. He's in Young Justice. He's in The Lion Guard. I mean, just a kid voice actor like you wouldn't believe. Wow. That's very cool. Yeah. So are we ready? Is that all your actors? Yeah. Okay. So the movie begins and we see this pigeon land on the pavement. And this is just a great bit that i wanted to point out that brings you right back into this world the pigeon turns it has two heads and horns Mm. (laughs) awesome we're already in monsters world a bus comes by a bunch of kids get out mike is left behind and you see the cutest little monster you didn't think any of them could get oh my goodness he is so cute with his little braces and he's so tiny and his eyes so big and they are going on a field trip to monsters inc Mm-hmm. Uh, to learn about the scarers and all the business and how it works and how they get their power fueled. And that's when they meet John Krasinski, who is a scarer and is like, I went to Monsters University. You got to go there. That's my school. Yeah. And then he, and then another guy's like, fear tech's where it's at. Yeah. Um, love, love that. Yeah. Which is already, it's just already great. A now, lot of, a lot of just tiny little things, but mostly showing, not telling. Yeah. And, um, and, and further on with them showing Mike gets into one of the rooms. He sneaks into one of the rooms, but yeah. most mostly because he is so in awe of this profession and what they get to. They're like superheroes. And he goes into the room, comes out with John Krasinski and John Krasinski's like, Whoa, th- that's really dangerous kid. Like I didn't even hear you come in. I didn't even hear you come, come in. in. And the yeah. kid, and he's just like, how do I get a job? He, how do I become a scarer? 
That's yeah, so and, cute. And this whole movie is such efficient storytelling because it's just like character, their goals. Okay, then they come up with the issues. How are they gonna get through it? Like, in the, that's the Pixar thing for the most part. And but I, yeah. like it, the 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 like right away, you're like, okay, I know what this movie's about. I'm ready. I'm in. Let's do this. And they did a really good job with. Uh, right off the bat, just showing how Mike and Sully were very different people than who we saw them at, as in Mar- Monsters, Inc. Yeah. Understandably, because they're young adults in this movie. So I would say, like, in Monsters, Inc., Mike is... I mean, he's very neurotic and, like, paranoid about stuff. Like, he just... He wants things to be just so. <laughs> like, it, it's just... This is all planned here, so I can go on this date here with Cecilia, and then uh, we scare, and we do a great job there. Life is perfect, and it's got, it's been figured out. Yeah. And I would say it's pretty true to form still um as a young adult being in college because he's doing everything he can to learn how to be a scarer that he is an expert he should be the one teaching classes that's how good he is yeah which makes a regular hermione he truly he truly (laughs) is Uh, but like what adds to it is he he has a you just see the passion he has for it Mm -hmm. his passion is learn every single detail you can learn about it yeah when Sully, you see, is a slacker because he was born into it. He was born scary. Yeah. Um, Mike, you see early on, had to work hard for everything to get where he's at. Sully didn't because of his name. And so he he's slacking off. He doesn't even bring anything into class because why would he need to? He's already scary. What you learn doesn't get him very far. <laughs> and, li- and wouldn't get him very far You're in doing life. such an excellent job. You've got, covered like 30 minutes of the movie. Movie's over and i do mean that i don't mean that disparagingly um yeah and and one thing i want to point out about this movie is there's always a temptation with prequels that is scary and dangerous um star wars is like a pretty egregious example of this where they and and i you know i and and he, actually, Fantastic Beasts is a great example too, where they kind of take back some things that have already happened, mm-hmm. or they downplay things. And what I love about this movie is it's a character study where they could go, um, let's just you know either Mike's already developed or Sully's already developed the way we saw him last, mm-hmm. or maybe they're just like characters that don't really make sense to who they are in the next movie. But they really do a good job of like. There's character growth that's going to happen in this movie, but there's still room for them to grow in the next movie. Yes, and I think they they show like there are still real consequences because we know where they end up. We're, right, we're right. never truly worried that they're not going to become a scarer because we have evidence that they are. Yeah. But I do think that they made the stakes really high still. They were they just did it. It was just really good writing because uh-huh. they're both in the scare program and they both get kicked out. And then you're just like, they got kicked out of the one that like the one degree they need to become a scarer. Yeah. <laughs> How do they become a scarer them? And of course they do it through a impossible way with, you know, a lot of courage through from especially Mike being like a team leader and all that. And so you just see like that passion in him continue. And he also inspires it in his frat brothers, but also especially solely inspires him and pushes him to be better. Yeah. Um yes, all of that. I agree with. <laughs> um one thing on a on a lighter note of this movie and and something I love in cartoon animation. A lot of bits in this movie. Yes. A lot yes. of bits. Some of them visual, like the football game where it shows like one guy get hit and then a bigger guy <laughs> and then a bigger guy and then this huge yeah. guy. Um another great bit though when they show up and I, of course, I never did this, but it felt very much like, oh, that's an that's a real experience that people are drawing on, just exaggerated a little bit. When they show up and it's like, hey, my name's Jay, and I'm the freshman, and I'm going to show you the way. Yeah, and then <laughs> yeah the orientation like, stuff. The yeah. orientation, and then she's like, hey, my name's Kay, and over there, that's where you can have a really fun day. And everything they said rhymed eventually. Yeah. And ended in A, and all of the names of the students that were helping them ended in Rhymed, A as well. Yeah. And I just felt like it, it was such a <laughs> it, it was such a uh, brutal description of the mono, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, the, the of college and how well, it's, yeah, it's like orientation is just like I'm going to be super welcoming because you made the right choice of spending thousands of dollars and being in debt to be here. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> and then they are Mike is walking through all of the state like the student clubs, which is also a really fun bit bitty thing that they do where it's like the debate team. Oh, okay, they're arguing. Of course, it's a two headed monster it's a two-headed that's arguing monsters. with itself. Yeah, come on, that's and, good. And then you see the improv guy. Who's bad at improv? <laughs> Very Great. funny. And then, then we learn about the scare games. Well, but and also we learn about the scare games. But also there is a monster that has like a paintbrushy head, and he he's oh, doing the, the art. art class. Yeah. Also, the textures on him, mm. I could not fathom. Mm. He sticks his head in paint and then smashes it on a painting, and it's a painting. That's an amazing bit. Yes. That's an amazing bit. The Very movie's good. full of bits. Full of them. You could have a stopwatch, and you'd have to stop it every every thirty seconds because there's another great bit. Yep. Um, it's, it was fun watching this movie too, and um, <laughs> when they're in class and stuff, and Dean Hard Scrabble's like, "Mike, you are not scary. Like, you don't have it. You're not uh-huh. gonna make it in this class once the finals come. It's just impossible." And you know, he he still has his confidence and his drive to do it, even though maybe she's right. And it's fun to know that because of the next movie, that he does get to shine. I mean, not only does he work really hard and become a scarer, like oh, but he basically gets to, he like, finds scare, like laugh the kids. Yeah, but like, and, and I would say in this movie, you know, he wants to be a scarer, but he really finds his strength, his strength in leading. Mm-hmm. Which once we get to the other movie. The, or the first movie mike and Sully are a team Sully scares mike does all the other stuff if that yeah. makes sense so um but yeah it's just fun to think that like he does get to, he does become like the the one in the spotlight though at the end wink wink because of all of the laughter totally totally and and, and another great thing is is in a lot of ways uh monsters inc is about sully and monsters university is about mike yeah I, um, I think that's a conscious choice that they made. Absolutely. Uh, and of course, John, John, uh, good or Scanlon, John Goodman, Wait, Goodman. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's for some reason, his name didn't sound right coming out of my mouth. John Goodman and, um, Bill, Billy Crystal, <laughs> Billy Crystal just do an amazing job. Amazing. Um, I, I mean, love them. Yes. The, I mean, the, those guys rule. Um, so we also find out that, and, and this is another example of, they didn't take back, from from monsters inc like we randall is mike's roommate roommate and he's just like a normal monster he just wants to be a scarer too he seems like a fun guy and you know mike's like before he gets into his room like this is gonna be your best friend for the rest of your life he opens the door and it's randall and it's like oh funny yeah that's a fun jab because he's not he's got to be a bad guy but you find out he's a nice guy he's just but a normal then guy later on in the movie when Sully beats randall in the scare games and you see Randall's like, that's the last time he's going to beat me. And it's like, Oh, then we see a little, the seed is planted yeah. for him becoming a villain into You us. could argue indulgence, but I think it, it works. It doesn't bother me though. No. And, and those are really the only things that they kind of are like next movie wink, right? Except for the abominable snowman. And that's a fun, bit. but that's at the end throwaway kind and of thing. And it's a great bit. Yes. We love bits. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but also let's talk about the fact that somehow it, through animation, they made all the characters look younger and it tracks. Yeah. That blows my mind. I bet that algorithm has a lot to help with it. Yeah. With the lighting. Also the glare on everyone's eyes. Which Come would be on. the lighting. Yeah. Um, and the everyone, uh, well not everyone, but like the, our main players. I mean, they, uh, they just have tiny little touches of why they look different. But a simple thing being is like in a, in some ways less detail. Mm hmm that makes sense you know when you get older you get wrinkles <laughs> yeah babies don't have wrinkles what just little things like that yeah um solely has funny uh, like a uh, calic right yeah all of that it, it it's just wild because y- you pointed out that stuff and i was like oh yeah okay you're right you're right but for me i was kind of watching the movie and i'm like why do they look younger yeah. it's like it was kind of blowing my mind and i couldn't even figure it out Probably it's, in the same way that you look at a picture of your parent when they're younger and you're like, they're younger. I don't know why they look younger. Yeah, well, it's like when they do de-aging in like a Marvel movie and it just doesn't look right. And it's like, they just right. look smooth, but it's still Michael Douglas. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, because they just took away wrinkles pretty much. I mean, right. they've come a long way with all of that yeah. stuff, but that's It'll like one of the easiest things you can do. To see how how those hold up to us in the future. Yeah. 
Because a lot of times CG, when it comes out, you're like, wow. Because yeah. I think of Samuel L. Jackson and Captain Marvel, and I'm like, he looked perfect. Mm. But I wonder if in five years I'll be like, oh, he looks a little wonky. Right. Um, that's the nature of special effects. Yeah. Somehow this movie isn't aging, though. So how do they get kicked out? Of they, the school? No, of the skier program. Oh, wow. Okay. That, what? Um, well, I mean, we had Sil- Silly and Mike meet. Yeah. Um, and there's like the pig. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, that's a great scene. (laughs) I I guess. So he's trying to get into a fraternity. Mike just wants to study. You find out right off the bat, they do not, they're not a good match in their current state. And that's when, uh, Mike really starts studying and the first cue of that March 4th song plays. Mm -hmm. Um, and a montage. We love a good montage. Uh huh. Now here's, one thing as well about this movie that I think really, really works. And I think people who write prequels should think about this. Um, this movie, let me know if you agree. I think that you could sit someone down and you could go, here's monsters university and they could watch it. Feel fully like feel the whole movie and everything. And then they could watch monsters Inc. You don't have to have seen Monsters, Inc. to watch this no, movie. No, And I think that's part of the brilliance of why this movie works so well for me because it's not, like, bogged down in, again, not to rag on this movie, but, like, S- Solo, you know, where it's mm-hmm. like, you, you know, if you watch Solo, you, you're going to be kind of confused at a lot of stuff because it's like, why do I care about this? Oh, everyone's watched a movie, but no matter the movie, like, let's in the middle of a series that yeah. they have never seen, and they're like... I bet if I've seen the other stuff, I'd know what that means. Or like, I bet if I'd read the book, I'd know what that means. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not that every prequel can't like reference the other thing, you know, it's depending on what it is, but, um, I just really like, even the Hobbit's a pretty bad example of like, if you haven't seen the Lord of the Rings, this thing that technically happened before, isn't going to make that much sense to you in a lot of ways. For a lot of reasons, but yes. Right. We have covered yeah, that thoroughly. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so then they go to the scare simulator final, and um, Sully kind of knocks Mike's books, and they start kind of, like, roaring at each other, and yeah. then they knock over um, cra- Crab Apple? Uh, hard Scrabble. Hard, hard, <laughs> hard Scrabble's r- record scream, yeah. and it flies all off. I love how it actually screams. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and then she kicks him out of the scare program. Mm-hmm. So then Mike is, like, depressed, and They're now in the creating the canisters. <laughs> yeah. And that, that guy says, um, uh, he says, some people say that creating cans is a waste of a monster's potential. Now open to page seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really good. <laughs> and the whole time you see that um, Sully is just staring. Sully's so pissed. At Mike. Yeah. Um, and then eventually Mike sees the poster for the scare games that he'd forgotten. And then he's like, if we win the scare games, you know, and he goes down to like the sign up thing. And you know, if we win hard scrabble, you got, can, would you let us back in? And she's like, yeah, cause you won't win. There's mm-hmm. no way. Mm-hmm. And then you have to be in a fraternity. To yeah. Even enroll. And uh, you know, band of misfits. It's the losers. Uzma Kappa. Yep. Um, okay. Funny that their initials are okay. Everyone's suck, initials you know? meant something. Really? Well, roar, hiss. Oh yeah. Another one that's a monster related thing, and then okay. But in this group, you have a middle aged man who has returned to college, who used to be in sales, Don Carlton. <laughs> <laughs> you have um, two. I mean, a, a conjoined monster that yes. uh, one of them loves to dance. Uh, the other, then, the, but they also like magic. So what's up, magic? Kind of dirty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, if we're going tropey, you know. Yeah. And yeah. then we have Charlie Day, uh, who is the purple fuzzy thing. Uh, and he's just an airhead. I mean, or a hippie, you know, he's just like one with nature, nature's one with me. Like, I yeah. love everything. Um, you're always gonna he's the wild card. You're yeah. always gonna love him. And then you have Squishy, who um who he is the son of the you know, 
<laughs> they're living <laughs> the, the so fraternities funny. at his mom's house. So he's just like, you know, embarrassed all the time, which yeah. of course he would be. That makes total sense. But you look at all of them. I mean, the guy's name Squishy. That guy's not a scarer. Right. No way. Um, but you do see, I mean, what's funny about it, like whether or not they're scary, they're all monsters. Right. Right. So they all in, innately have, uh, you know, the potential to scare. Yes. Um, and that's how they basically they learn through what their strengths are mm -hmm. throughout the movie, throughout the games. What I really yeah. like about Squishy is he is dead silent. So at the, yeah. the last game where they do the simulation and he's just quiet, you, the kid looks over again, he's gone. The kid <laughs> looks over right next to him and he's right there. With like those dead like fish eyes. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't even move. <laughs> it's so funny. Um, in the, uh, there's also this great scene where they do like in a, a fraternity initiation mm -hmm. and Squishy's mom is like doing the laundry in the background oh, and dancing. I was laughing so hard. We were laughing so the hard. The shot was blocked perfectly because oh, yeah. you have Mike and then you have Squishy just hit struggling so hard that just the the facial expressions were perfect. And they get the him. like sound of the washing machine doing the like. <laughs> yeah, and she's out of focus in the back, but her little butt's just bouncing <laughs> Shaking around because she's kind of dancing to the washing machine. Yeah, very cute. Um. And so then they're like, they do the first scare game. Mm -hmm. And um, this game, every time I watch a scene, I laugh so mm -hmm. hard because I just love that style of animation that's a little bit on the outskirts where where it's like defying the laws. Not that this movie doesn't defy the laws of physics, but it does like... It, like Hotel Transylvania kind of stuff, like weird animation weird, weird, weird. instead yeah. of like realism, but it's monsters. Yeah. And it, they have these spike balls, and when it hits them, they, they puff the up like a balloon. Glow urchins, I think. Glow urchins, yeah. yes. And it is just hysterical to watch as the team gets hit by them and they get big. <laughs> and I, it's just funny. It's like you gotta laugh. <laughs> you just gotta laugh. So, and they, they have, you know, the, the attention to detail. Like, there's people that throw these urchins, and they're wearing gloves. Yep. So they, like, cover their bases, you know? Right. Very simple things that are easy to forget because you're animating a very complicated movie. Talk about world building. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so in this game, Mike and Sully are racing against each other, which, you know, their bullheadedness is like, keeping them from listening, and, like, they need to finish the race together. Yeah. As a team. Not just one of them. Right. So very clear message we very like clear it. message so you know soon after this you know they're like okay well we need to figure out a way to work together mike's trying to you know still spearheading everything but solely is just like you can tell them what to do but you're not telling me what to do uh -huh. <laughs> so then they do the is the the library one after that um yes yes so they do the library one they you can't be caught by the librarian love her shh the character design is unreal. And like I love that she's gray. Slug. She's like boring colors. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. So you see here, they're trying to work together as a team. And then solely very quickly is like, I'm just going to do it. This is taking too long. No patience. We're winning right now. Of course that, uh, you know, everything falls apart, but because everyone else wants to be working together, they do the whole misdirection. Yeah. Or, they, they or do distraction thing. What, what someone call distracting Smaug from his gold. Sure. With the hobbits. Sure. Um, but but yeah, this is a great scene because this is when Mike's starting to realize like maybe I don't have it all figured out because mm -hmm. then then they all get out and he's like, yeah, that was great. Um, we didn't get the flag. And then Squishy's like, I got the flag. Yeah. Because he's quiet and right. he just went and got it. And so then they're like, okay, let's try and figure out our our um, differences and and play to those strengths. But meanwhile, Mike and Sully are like, we're never going to, these guys aren't, they yeah, just Sully's don't like, we got to get a new team. Even and though they did is, that great thing, you know? Yeah. And, and everyone, even though they've made it through two rounds, they're really, they're still really, there's just no confidence because yes. no one ever told them that they could do something like this. They never had and this they, kind of positive reinforcement. Yeah. And I think they were all in the scare program at one point well, and kicked I, out. I got that. That I think they or said they that. never even had the guts to apply. Yeah. Because they were, you know, no one ever gave them that kind of like courage to, or, you know, confidence to do I, it. I just think in the scene where they show up, I think Don says that they they got kicked out. I think so too. Like they didn't last. Yeah, they um, didn't last. But then they go to, they're invited to a party. So they're like getting um, mm -hmm. accepted. And 
the lighting's insane. It's just unbelievable. Um, the party's cool, funny, more bits. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they get paint dumped on them and sparkles thrown on them and flowers and a picture's taken of them. And then everywhere, it's like circulated like everywhere. a bunch of cute little babies, you know. They're not tough guys. Yeah. They're not scarers. And, and oh, true to... The picture's so funny. What? The picture's so funny. It's very funny. And, and you know, like Pixar is very good at their characterization. So, like, all the characters are, like, surprised by the picture. But then Charlie Day's character is smiling and he's happy. He's yeah. he's always happy with whatever situation it is happening. <laughs> And, um, and so then they're like, okay, we don't have it in us. Like, I, it's I'm over. not worried about it. Yeah. And that's when Mike's like, you know what? I need to inspire these guys. I need to inspire them. So the, I think what's great about him being the leader of the group too, is because in a lot of ways, he has always been told that he can never be a scarer too. And so the one person who shouldn't have confidence is inspiring all the other guys who, in yeah. a lot of ways he fits into their group based on how his yeah. character's created, but he won't let that stop him. Mm-hmm. Um, and a big reason, so they he takes them to Monsters, Inc., and they kind of sneak up to the window to look in at the, all the guys working. This is like a scene that makes me like feel warm. It's a really good scene. So I think it's a very underrated Pixar scene. Like oh, it, it, yeah. It's a great scene. It's amazing. So they're all looking in, they're watching the, all of the scarers work, and they're like, oh my gosh, look, at it's that guy. That guy's old, and he's still working. He's He held the record for three years. And then they show a, a girl monster, and like, oh, she's like, she held the record for this many years. Like, yeah. she's amazing. And they're just seeing all, basically, how all different they look. Well, because then, remember, Mike says what do all these scarers have in common? And they're like, I don't know. And he goes, exactly. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. And, and look he, at us. Yeah. Look at us. And he, even the camera cuts to a fluffy little, uh, the scarer about to enter a room. And then he has all these tentacles and he you turns know, into like a spider. Kind it's of like, thing. it's a cute looking thing, but yeah, but then it looks like a spider. Yeah. So it's like, who, you know, maybe that, you know, to look at that and be like, I wonder how hard it was for someone like that or whatever. So, you know, everyone's watching and they're being inspired by this and Sully finally gets it. Yeah, and this is when Mike and Sully um, realize that they both collected scare cards. Yes, which and, means they're just, they're not that different. Right, and and what one thing that I love about this movie is I think they do a really good job of subtly building their friendship. Yeah. Because, you know, they're, they're enemies and then when they're on the same team, they're still in competition but then they they do wrap around a common goal of like we're the only ones that know anything. Mm-hmm. And then this is the first moment where it's like maybe we're friends or maybe we could be friends and it feels very naturalistic. I think it's totally. a, very wonderfully and beautifully written. I think it's this scene when Sully is like I've been a real jerk to you Mike. And I love and Mike's says, response. Yeah. I I've been a real jerk to you too. Yeah, it's really it's really great. It's great because I you know they went into this. I mean, the whole reason they got kicked out is because they thought that they were better than the other person. When Mike is essentially, well, what is essentially proven in the scene is that no one's better than anyone. Yeah, and then and then we have another montage where they're like working out and they're yeah. figuring things out and just great efficient storytelling things like mike waking him up and then toward the end of the montage like sully wakes up first and he's like let's go yeah you're just like i get it yeah i get it you you told me more in that than you could have in a scene of dialogue right just wonderful and then um now they're they're at the final they're in the scare simulator yes so um it's like each team it's it's them and roar omega roar and before this, uh, Hard Scrabble had told Sully, like, I I believe you you know you guys are a bunch of good scarers except for one, and I think you know who it is. And tomorrow that will be proven. Right. She's talking about Mike. So then you see Sully like, I got to do something. In his yeah. eyes. Yeah, and um, I I like how they set up him tampering because it's like I get why he did that. Mm-hmm. Even though later Mike's like, that was so selfish. And you're like, oh, yeah, he's right, too. It, mm-hmm. It's it's one of those great conflicts that feels like neither one of them are wrong. Mm-hmm. So you're a little conflicted as well. Yeah. Because he's like motivated by pride, but he's also motivated by like not wanting his friend to feel bad. Yeah. And the team. Yeah. To win. Yeah. Um, Because because they, they do the scares and everyone does good. And then Mike ends it and he uh, he's after Sully and he he uh like scares it like breaks a record yeah. kind of a scare 
And then later, Mike's kind of just reveling in the glory, yeah. and he sees that under the bed it was tampered. Yeah. And that's when he figures out Sully did it. Now, I do have one complaint about this movie that I'd like to talk about. Okay. Um, and I'd love for you to fix it for me, because I don't want to have a complaint about this movie. But I do think, especially with the group of people that are in the fraternity, the whole movie they're like, Mike, you're not scary. Mike, you're not scary. Mike, you're not scary. But I think fundamentally, he is more scary than all of the other fraternity people. Like, he looks scarier, he acts scarier, but then at the end, they're kind of just magically, like, really, really scary, and he wouldn't have been able to pull that off. I, well, it just comes down to he does not have the it factor. It's yeah. A, it's as simple as that. I mean, someone can be, know literally everything about basketball and have played basketball since they were in the YMCA, and then it comes time to them wanting to go to college to play basketball, and they don't get recruited because they're just not talented enough. That happens all the time. Yeah. So it, it, that I I believe in that. I guess, but I I don't believe that the, his fraternity has the it factor. I think, and yet he well, doesn't. I think that he brought in brought out their potential, uh-huh. and you saw it in the meat on how much they scared in the simulation, right? And then you see that he probably would have done at least as much, as good as them, maybe not. Does right. that make sense? So I'm not. It's not so, to say that he's scarier than them, but yeah. maybe he's at least as scary as them. So would would you say? I guess. I guess it comes down to this. Do you think had Mike? I mean, had Sully not tampered with it? Do you think Mike would have done well in the scare simulator? I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> it's theoretical. Yeah, I don't know. Because I guess I think I think it's one of those interesting things where you, you're watching him do everything by the book. On how uh, he should be scaring with the creepy stuff leading up to the big roar. Yeah. So he's doing everything by the numbers. But it's kind of maybe one of those classic things where it's like doing things by the... You, you can do the things by the numbers as much as you want, but you're not solely. Right. And even in this uh, competition, solely did... He followed... Like, he, he read the notes on the kid, and he scared the kid how the kid should be scared. He learned how to adapt to how someone should be scared. Yeah. When... At the beginning of the movie, all he would just do is roar. Yeah. And that does, and like we see with Boo, stuff. doesn't, doesn't work. I mean, it did work at the end of the movie in Monster mm-hmm. Inc. But like, she didn't find him scary. Yeah. So, and then I guess I'm kind of rambling and losing my No, it, thought, no, no but it like, makes sense. I, I don't know if he would have. Cause I, like, I don't think Dean Hardscrabble is just a B for no reason. I think like she has good taste in terms, she knows she's yeah. an expert. She's done it for years and now she's an expert in it. Yeah, I I guess, but that doesn't. That's not it, to mean that he she can't be proven wrong. Uh, yeah, I I love the movie. It's just it's just like one of those things that I wish I could like turn that off when I watch it. Yeah, if that makes sense, because yeah. it's just the one thing that doesn't really make sense to me. I I think you did a good job, but it still doesn't quite like turn the key all the way for I me think, to be like yes. I that think what makes that away less sense is like she is going to kick him out because she doesn't think he's scary enough to go through the program when it's established in the first movie that it's like a two person team at monsters Inc. Yeah. One of them scares, one of them doesn't. So it doesn't really matter if Mike's scary or not. If anything, it matters that he knows everything. Yeah. Therefore he's a good leader. Yeah. Therefore he should be able to go through the program. Yeah. If that makes sense. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I agree with that. And it's such a minor thing to pick. Yeah. At. But it is just a weird, it's, I'm just not convinced that he couldn't do it. I guess, I guess I would say if Mike hadn't have pulled that switch, he would have done fine. Hmm. But then again, in the next scene, he, he breaks into. And he can't scare the kids. He can't scare the kids. And I think that scene, they kind of like fix it for me, if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, to set that up in case someone hasn't watched it in a while. So yeah. So this whole thing happens. Yeah. With the cheating. And um, Mike goes into the, I guess, the department where they're making doors. <laughs> and he goes into th- one of them. And meanwhile, as that's happening, uh, Sully is confessing to Dean Hart Scrabble that he cheated. So she kicks him out of the program. It kicks him out, period. Yeah. Um, under Totally understandable. You know, and it's almost like, oh, but you just made it back in, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But also he did the right thing by fessing up but he you know he knows that 
there's an emergency that goes out that someone's like using a door who shouldn't be Sully knows it's him yeah goes to answer the call so then it cuts back to mike who you see is the one that used the door and so he's going to scare a kid unbeknownst to him he is at a camp and it's a whole cabin of children yeah which is like oh that sucks and that reveal is kind of like oh i think it just proves over the top that it doesn't quite that he just doesn't have it i think also at that time too you know he's because of everything that Sully did with cheating he he wants to prove this to himself now yeah but i don't know even if it was one kid if he could do it because his confidence was kind of shot because it, that's true does that that's, make sense? yeah yeah um and then mike breaks in against the teacher's wishes and Sully. stuff i mean Sully. and by the time he gets there like police have arrived mm-hmm. and then he kind of runs off and finds him um, and they have a nice heart to heart and it's, it's like, that's when, that's when they realize that they aren't different because Mike's been trying to achieve this goal, but he's not scary. Mm-hmm. And then Sully's like, yeah, but I've had this name following me around and you like, I've, I'm such a fail. We're both failures. Yeah. Cause Sully says I am scary, but I'm afraid all of the time. Yeah. And he's like, why did you never tell me that? Another great scene. Yeah. And he, and he says, uh, well, we were never friends before. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um okay um where are the kleenex at <laughs> and uh then then they they're basically like okay we're stuck because hard scrabble turns off the door yes which is like oh, hard so then mike's like maybe we can power it enough that we can get back which is and, like and oh this what is, this is cool because this is like when he realizes what he can do his, he, he can realizes ha- his potential yeah yes and then he also encourages Sully, like you got this mm-hmm. and there he's like we need to scare the adults the police mm. and Sully's like adults we can't do that yeah and and i like this here's another thing i like about this scene it's very epic mm-hmm. and it's it's like this is something that they would remember but it's not something it, it, it's or they're like, remember that one time you went through the door and I had to come back and get you. Right. It's it's thing? not something that's weird that it's never addressed in Monsters Inc. Does that make sense? No, totally. Because I mean, there, it's not like I'm going through life and there's this big existential moment that I have and I'm not still talking about it. I know yeah. it's you, like, we're comparing something that was written to something that people go through. No, but, but uh, you know, because because i I, like remember that time you realized your potential i'm just trying to think i guess uh, hobbit is is an example in a different way where it's like they tried to make the hobbit so epic that it's like weird when you rewatch lord of the rings because you're like how come this is just as important as that right and And, it shouldn't be and this this scene in monsters university feels very much like it's it's epic for this movie but it doesn't um overshadow anything in the next movie and i think what helps with that is they're both very different movies they're about very different things yeah and it yeah it helps because one you know this is more of like a college movie you Mm -hmm. know they follow the like college movie well it's the self-realization of who you are as a person and then the other movies i mean a lot of it is about being a parent yeah um and so then and here's another thing the the another pixar thing very horror influenced Mm -hmm. the sequence and I, I love that when the police come into the cabin, Mike Sully puts Mike on the floor and he scurries across the floor <laughs> and then he'll like pick him up yeah. on the other side. There's and a creepy then, doll. There's uh, <laughs> one of the beds start like shaking. shaking. And, they do all of the horror tropes. Yeah, they turn on like the record player. Yep. And then finally Sully jumps down and Mike pulls these strings that trips all the police and he roars roars and they really scream Mm. and it powers up like crazy so much so that it explodes as they like jump through yeah plus all of the scream canisters in that room get filled and start screaming everywhere to even add more to it dean harbscrabble is terrified Mm -hmm. a woman who you is like the ice queen yes and um and she's like trembling even when they're there you know she's like what happened so then they both get expelled yeah and then they're getting Mike's getting on a bus. And well, you got to you got to wrap it up with the frat boys. So at the frat house, oh. telling them that they got expelled, and they're all really bummed about it. But uh-huh. and they're like, "I'm really sorry oh. that we got expelled," which means you guys also probably didn't get in the program. And, and they like, were like, "No, no we did." Like Dean Hardscrabble was so impressed with us that she let us back in, which is just like that is so sweet. Yeah, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> um, and then you also see that. Uh, 
Don Carlton is now dating Squishy's mom, which is hilarious. Another funny bit. And then they're all, you know, Mike and Sully have to leave and they all hug goodbye. And yeah. then, go ahead. And then, finally, you know, Mike and Sully are leaving and Mike's getting on a bus to go away. And then Sully stops the bus and is like, but we're friends, basically. And then... We can figure something out. We yeah. gotta stick together. Which, it's very romantic comedy ending, yes, which I love. it is. And then um, Mike is like, well, they're always hiring in the mailroom. And we, I do I do want to add, too, because Dean Hartscrabble, like, shows up, which is a little, like, why? But also, <laughs> yeah. I do like that, you know, she shows... Basically, she wanted to make sure that they got off the property. <laughs> she's, like, away <laughs> yeah. with these people. But, she, you know, she's like pretty much saying i i was proven wrong and i need now i'm going to keep my eyes open for things that surprise me like you guys did something that's never happened you surprised me so i'm going to pay attention to things that could now and it's like i like that they you know her character changed too and she wasn't even really that big of a character she was yeah kind of a villain uh-huh. but she became a better person for it i mean because she's not 100 percent a villain yeah. She's just a cold hearted person. <laughs> but um yeah, so then they get jobs in the mailroom and we get one last great montage. Yeah, and it's two. The March Fourth song yes. again. Um, which is called Well, we're I, I it's uh, the song's called Rise Up, but mm-hmm. also I'm sure we talked about that in the interview. So yeah. but listener, definitely go check them out. Their new album's really good. Yeah. Um listen to them, okay? Do it and tell them we sent you, because <laughs> that'll be cool. Um then okay so but what's great so this this scene shows them go up the, the ladder yeah. into monsters inc and and finally make it to the scare floor yeah um very sweet and it, it kind of you know ends the same way it started where mike is taking his first step into college and this ends with him taking his first step into his job as a scare yeah and and also before that the abominable snowman is oh, like yeah. which i don't know that they actually ever met him because i think in monsters inc they're like who are you but whatever it's it, it's a good bit <laughs> but um he's like he's like don't forget don't tamper with mail it's punishable by banishment and you're <laughs> like that's why he got banished yeah. <laughs> a so little good. indulgent but the kind that i'm into it's at the end of the movie where nothing else matters yeah it's so great um so that's the movie yeah it's lovely yeah i love this movie me too i love them both i i don't think this one is better than the first movie but it's different enough that it's not there's no need to compare them really. This is like a guardian situation to me. Like so when we yeah. as you know see the guardians episodes but see guardians ones one loved it. Guardians 2 came out and it genuinely did not matter if the movie sucked. I was going to love it. Yeah. Thankfully it was better than the first one. Yeah. So when we went back and watched the first one for the podcast I was like I kind of hope I'm not like bored because I know all the jokes now. Yeah. And I'd seen it several times previous to that, but I found to enjoy it more. Like there were still things to enjoy about it. Yeah. And that's how I felt about this movie. Cause monsters Inc was so good that when they announced monsters university, it's like, could be genuinely anything. I'm going to love it. Uh huh. And it's just the same. I just get more out of both of them every time I watch them. And that leads me to, I think they should make one more. And I think because we got Monsters, Inc., we got Monsters University. I think it should be Monsters Retirement Center. And it's Mike and it's Sully. It's got to be before John Goodman and Billy Crystal go, and they're kind of old. That's why it would be perfect to start getting them in the studio if they, now. If even one of them it can't, they passes can't be away, you yeah. can't make a third one. But I really think it would be amazing. And um, I don't know what it would be, but, I mean, it could just be about um, aging out of something that you love and trying to find purpose in a different way Mm -hmm. that could maybe be the theme um pixar we know you're listening um i'd love you know we know your patreon subscribers we know that yeah we have pixar as a patreon subscriber um they do the three dollar tier though i'd think they could maybe beef it up to ten and and if you're a three dollar we love that but pixar (laughs) you know they should be they should be doing 10 but paying us 50 if you know what i mean um so (laughs) so I think, and I'm. This might seem like a joke to you, but I'm serious. If I want them to make Monsters Retirement Center, I think it would be absolutely amazing. And we need more old pe- old cartoons, like old people in cartoons. Just imagine, like Sully's kind of graying, you know, his hair, and he's getting old, and it's 
<clears throat> it writes itself. So I think that should happen um, n- next month. So you're a patron. You know what's up. Well, first of all, we have another episode for you patrons this month, if, if you can believe it. What? We're coming out with the Terminator 2, um, 3D... Oh. Um, uh, Experience. Yeah, the um, Race Against Time, or I can't the, remember what the it's Universal called. The Universal 4D Experience. Ba- battle Across 3D Time. Experience. Terminator th- 2, 3D, Battle Across Time. So there are two Terminator 2s, technically? Yeah. I mm. guess. Um. Well, okay, it, let's it, wrap it up. What? But that's coming out this yeah. month, folks. So look forward to another extra Patreon episode. Tell your friends. And then next month, we're going to be covering a new MPU, the sequel series. We're hitting the gremlins. We because, are? Yeah, we talked about... You never about, told me this. Oh, I didn't? Well, we're hitting the gremlins. I'm finally going to watch it. Yes, because um, Gremlins 1 is a Christmas movie. Oh, you, you, I think you mentioned this a long time ago. Yeah, and and uh, then, uh, uh, you know, it's a Christmas movie and it's Christmas time. So we're doing Gremlins and then January would be Gremlins 2. And then I don't know what we're doing after that. Maybe maybe it'll either be a you decide or maybe a Patreon decide. I don't know. But um, anyway, thank you so much for thank listening. You. Hope you and enjoyed the interview. We'll see you uh, in a couple of weeks when we do Terminator 2D. Bye. Bye.